Hi everybody and welcome for, to this new chapter of Movistar Team Talks. This time we have a writer from the USA, Mateo Jorkenson. Mateo, how are you doing? Hello, Albert. I'm doing well. I'm doing uh, great. I'm just adjusting to European time zone. Okay, so you just got from the USA? Yeah, I just got back a few days ago. Uh, today was my third day back in Europe, I think. Okay, third day, and you're not still used to Europe? What's it, what is it? The food? The water? <laughs> what do we have? <laughs> for you. No, no, I, I think I'm used to the food and water, but uh, no, the it's like a nine hour difference. So I'm just trying to, uh, trying to adapt, trying to sleep at the correct times. <laughs> okay, that's very important thing. Regarding your life at the States or your holidays at the States, uh, can you tell us how is it going for you there on, over the past, these past few weeks? Because we saw you training in California, spending the holidays yeah. with your family at home, at the mountains. Uh, did this year felt more special considering that uh, you were, it was your first uh, full pro season, the pandemic? Yeah, no, no, for sure. Uh, it was a bit, I was a bit all over the place, actually, this, this last fall. Uh, it was a really nice disconnect. I think, like, this season was a bit strange just because I was basically training for the entire year. I mean, I didn't have many race days, so it was just, like, a year of, um, of looking at the Garmin and the Watts and Uh, so it was good to have a, a couple months of, of disconnect. I, I kind of road tripped, uh, took my car and drove down from Idaho down the Californian coast a little bit, starting in San Francisco for a week or two, and then uh, went down to Los Angeles. And yeah, it was, it was really amazing. It was a nice time and good to be back in the U.S. for a bit because I think this, this season I'll be mostly in Europe. So it was a good uh, low-stress off-season for me. So you went south of the country because I understand in Idaho the weather can be hard sometimes. Not yes. it, and it's not precisely the biggest hub of cycling of the U.S., I understand. <laughs> no, no, you're correct. Uh, yeah, I, I, I tried to get out of Idaho as soon as I possibly could. Um, the weather gets pretty bad around November, so it can be just really cold. I mean, we don't get much precipitation, but uh, California is definitely, definitely better. And um, yeah, it, it was, it was like 75, I guess I'm talking in Fahrenheit, but uh, it was 75 degrees Fahrenheit every day. I'm not even sure what that is in Celsius, but pretty much perfect, perfect temperature for riding a bike every single Sounds day. Sounds hot in Celsius, gotta tell you. Sounds pretty hot in Celsius. Yeah, a little too hot in Celsius, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's see if uh, this this month, this resting has has had a good effect on, on you and not about your physical performance, but also about your quickness of mind because you're going to face the first challenge of the season against Perfect. the clock. I gotta tell you that whatever happens today, today uh, you are going to be on the top 20 because you okay. are the 20th rider to... Uh, oh, wow take this challenge from that's, the starting talks. That's a big achievement already, so. Okay, <laughs> so you start, you know, uh, with high expectations. Yes. So, remember, uh, these are quick firing questions, so the shorter the answer, the quicker, the better. Okay, okay. ready? Sounds good, yes. Okay, three, two, one. Place of birth. Uh, Walnut Creek, California. Date of birth. 7199. First bike. Specialized. First year as a pro. Uh, 2018. Favorite TV show? Uh, none. Favorite movie? Don't have one. And favorite book? Uh, probably Harry Potter series. Beer or wine? Uh, wine. Finger steaks or trout? Trout. Training in the morning or in the afternoon? Afternoon. Alone or with the others? Alone with others. Alone. Cold or warm weather? Mm, cold. The canyon bike, aeroad or ultimate? Uh, aeroad. The elite turbo trainers, fixed or rollers? Fixed. The Agus helmets, air breaker or game changer? Uh, game changer. Long socks or short socks? 
long. Favorite race? Uh, uh, Tour de France. Favorite climb? Um, Mont Chauve, Nice. Cobbles or gravel? Uh, gravel. Hardest race ever? Uh, our Grand Tour. Your favorite moment of this past season? Uh, Liège, Bastogne, Liège. Your favorite female cyclist? Um, uh, Annemiek van Vluten. Your favorite male cyclist? Valverde, Alejandro Valverde. Which cyclist would you choose to party from the team? Um, I'm gonna say Matthias. Which cyclist would you choose to travel by bike? Um, probably Johan. Where would you go on that travel? Um, probably here in Nice. Two minutes, 16 seconds. That puts you, let's see, two minutes, Not 16. Good. Okay, this is interesting. Same time, same time as, Albert, as Alejandro Valverde and the Oh, wow. <laughs> We have a signing here for the years to come. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that says too much, but... <laughs> well, well, well. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so let's begin with the proper interview, not only the, the test. Uh, yeah. See, most people are yet to know you well, which is just normal, having spent only a shortened season with the pros. Uh, we, want, we wanted to talk to you about the, your, your origins, uh, that because if we're not mistaken, your older brother Pisto also pursued an interesting cycling career before you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, my brother actually started cycling before I did. Uh, he's the one who got me into cycling and um, convinced me, I guess. I mean, he, he didn't try to convince me, but just by watching, I was convinced to start cycling. And um, he was always like, a few years ahead of me so he went he basically took all the steps um before i did he was on the national team first he uh went to europe first before me he went to the world championships before me so i kind of got uh you know a taste of what it was like from him uh beforehand and i was able to be ready for each step and um yeah it, it was super it was great having him uh, riding before me and and uh, we both grew up, you know, riding bikes. But what we really wanted to know is the story about how you went uh, from a kit on a bike to taking the steps forward to to Edge Under 23. Because we'd read this anecdote of Bello News that you spend like one hour every night writing emails to every single European development continental team to find the spot. Is that true? How can you tell us? What can you tell us? Yeah, for a period of time, that is true. Um, yeah, I, basically in, I believe it was 2017, um, I was in Europe uh, preparing for the Junior World Championships. I was a last year junior and uh, I had no team for the year uh, to come. I was told uh, that I wouldn't be on action, which is, you know, the normal step for an American um, an American cyclist, uh, American young cyclist, when uh, you're, I mean, usually if you're one of the best juniors, American juniors, you go to action. Usually it's the best two or three riders per, per year. Um, and I didn't make the cut that year. So I had, I had, a, I, I was, you know, told right around then that I wouldn't make it. And so I started to, uh, you know, when I was in Europe, there was nothing else to do other than train in the in the day and then at night uh, try to figure out what I was going to do the next year. So I would, uh, yeah, that's true. I would write. I basically got a list of emails from um, from the director of the U23 program at the time, Nate Wilson, and he uh, gave me probably mm, 30 emails. And so every night I'd try to write like a personalized email to each team. Um, usually they were you know, pretty similar, but uh, sometimes I do it in different languages to, you know, foreign teams that I know don't speak English. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't get many responses. I probably, out of 30 emails I wrote, I probably got 10 that responded. And uh, I think probably seven or eight were just no or were full for the, for the year coming. So 
uh, yeah, I, it narrowed it down to three options and then uh, nothing actually worked that year. And I, I stayed within the US uh, that next year. I, I, it wasn't until December that I was able to get um, a spot on Jelly Belly. Uh, so it was really late, but I was able to get a spot and continue riding, uh, that next season domestically. And then I was able to use the national team, the U S national team as kind of a entryway back into Europe, uh, with the under 23 program. And thankfully I had some good, some good results in, in France. And, uh, one of the teams I had reached out to, but had said no was, uh, Chambry, which is the AG2R, um, development team. And they, um, they wanted to take a chance and, and bring me over as the first American. So, uh, yeah, huge opportunity. And, and uh, I started learning French right away. Whoa, no minor fit. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, is it really that hard or, or does it really feel that hard for American athletes to find your place in the continent? Uh, do you sometimes feel like a bit of a stranger in here? Yeah, I think uh, for sure. I mean, uh, the culture, I think within Europe, there's obviously different cultures. Every every country has a slightly different way of life, and but it's all relatively similar in a, in a way uh, versus the United States is just a totally different, uh, totally different way of living. And, and uh, you know, everything looks different, things, uh, you know, People act differently. It's different in public spaces. So, yeah, when you come over here, it's definitely a culture shock. And to add to that, I think, uh, you know, these European teams, they are cautious of Americans because in the past they've had development teams have had, you know, trouble with uh, bringing young Americans over. They basically, you know, they, we have a record, I guess, of coming over to development teams and then not following through and, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, the, the, the quote is cracking where you basically make it partway through the year and you, um, you get really mentally fatigued and you just want to go home. So a lot of riders have, <clears throat> have done that over the years. So teams are just cautious of bringing on Americans in general. So uh yeah it was hard to prove to a team that i would be ready for that and how did you uh, did your signing to to our team came to be because i guess it was mostly our ceo uh, sebastian Zuek, who came into contact with you during 2019 but how did it yeah. forge yeah uh it was basically right before the tour de l'avenir um they got into contact with me because they had seen just kind of my consistency throughout that year with results and um i was solid in a lot of different types of terrain that year and before avenir um they actually gave me an offer and then uh i didn't i didn't respond uh until after tour de l'avenir where i had pretty good results and then uh by then i knew i was uh, basically I, i couldn't at that point decide if I was ready to to move up to a pro level or not because you know a lot of the debate is if you should stay under 23 for another year or or go professional and I wasn't quite sure at that point um, if I was ready to handle you know a uh, full professional uh, workload and and the races that come along with it so uh, Tour de l'Avenir kind of concreted that I was You ready and uh, and I'm glad I'm super glad that I went professional because 2020 was a strange year and to be professional and it was uh, definitely better than than staying down in the under 23s. Well, that really shows up that you had your you have your shed your head on your shoulders because uh, any other rider would say before even riding the avenue would say okay yeah I will sign uh, I don't care what well, <laughs> just put me the paper I will sign anything. And then get what <laughs> yeah. you see. But you really thought that uh, you you had to be mentally prepared and physically prepared, and you really had to be convinced in order not to deceive other people, right? What yeah, was... for sure. I mean, I just uh, yeah, it, it's a choice. Uh, if, if you don't feel ready, and um, if if you're not convinced that that you're ready, then if, I think if you don't have the confidence to go professional at at a certain point, and you do go professional. I think it's much harder because in the races you don't feel like you fit at that level and uh, things can can go go south pretty quickly. But uh, you know, I think if if you if you're convinced and you have the confidence, it makes the step a lot easier. So 
uh, I wasn't at that point convinced I, I, I would, would be able to handle it. But surprisingly honest, to be, to be, <laughs> to be honest myself. Uh, so how has this team felt to you during this, this first season in blue? You obviously have got on really well with people like Johan and Mati like Matthias. And you actually joked that being the, the third uh, Jorgensen sibling on the team, along with Matthias yeah. and Emma. Uh, but how did you get with an organization which has traditionally felt like really Spanish-centric? And coming from abroad, it seemed like piercing a bubble that was <laughs> like that for, for years. Yeah, no, I mean, it was difficult at first. I, um, I wasn't, you know, prepared for in Spanish at the first camp in um, in Pamplona last year and I think it was uh, a lot at once but to be honest it it's uh, it's a really nice culture within the team that they are very like caring about the young guys and they really try to include uh, try to include us despite you know uh, not not all of us speak Spanish that well yet so they, they really put forth an effort you guys and and all the riders, all the Spanish riders on the team, put forth a big effort to make us feel included and uh, and help us out and you know try to speak English to us when uh, we can't get our point across in Spanish. So it's it's a nice uh, it's a nice compromise, and I am really enjoying it. So a year after, how was your Spanish going on? Pretty well, actually. I can say that I have a um, a good streak on Duolingo right now. I'm 35 days uh, into Duolingo now, so. 35 days straight, so pretty good. No, I mean, I'm trying my best over this off season to, to double down and really look Spanish because it's super important in this team to be able to communicate uh, really freely and openly. So uh, I understand the value of it and I'm trying quite hard to, to learn Spanish. So when a cyclist comes to a team that speaks only Spanish, only French, or not only, but mainly, uh, yeah. What's the first thing you learn from the language? The technical stuff uh, or, or the basic stuff that uh, any other people will, will learn from, an, from a language? Yeah, I mean, for sure you learn a lot of cycling terms. You learn uh, all the parts of the bike in, in Spanish. Uh, so, you know, what a wheel is, handlebars, all that. You learn that uh, pretty quickly because it's necessary to communicate and then uh, also, I think it's super important to learn kind of tactical language. So like breakaway, fuga, uh, you know, all the words that you would use in a race in the radio uh, to understand the radio and, and then to talk with your teammates in the race. So that stuff's really important. But also, I mean, you just need to learn uh, normal Spanish, what someone would learn in school. Uh, I've been just working on like uh, verbs and conjugating in the past tense, future tense, and uh, stuff like that. I mean, it's just super important to be able to uh, understand the structure of the language. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that will to improve is what made you almost be on the final seven for the Grand Tour, on, for a Grand Tour in 2020, because you were twice uh, in line twice for, for the Giro and for La Vuelta. Uh, you actually made it to Irún as a reserve and sadly you had to leave. But I guess just looking forward to, to that Grand Tour debut at last. Uh, this year you turned 22, but in 2021, are you looking forward for it to happen? For sure. Uh, yeah, I, I really um, I'm looking forward to it. And yeah, I mean, this year I felt uh, I felt at the beginning of the year, I didn't feel ready to start a Grand Tour. And then as the year went on, I, I definitely gained enough confidence to to be to feel ready. And uh, I, I really wanted to start one. But, you know, it's not that much of a difference to start one this year. I'm still quite young and have a lot of time. Time's on my side for sure. So I um, I would be happy to start one this year. That's uh, that'd be a huge objective and hu huge accomplishment for me. Mm -hmm. Time's on your side and we will get back to it. Uh further but uh regarding your your performance this year the aspect you excelled the most was that uh were, were the one day events the, the toughest with one day event we especially remember the good performances in Grand Atlético Lombardo uh, mm -hmm. uh, where you fared far the way uh really well against some of the world's best in in, in really miserable conditions uh, the weather was was the rain was too much, Terrible. and about that, 
uh, two monuments, your first on Remo, where you came in 17th, and Liege, Baston Liege, uh, on the attack despite the nasty crash. Uh, so uh, we can expect uh, to you to perform in, in several aspects of the, of the profession. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I think one days are the the I mean, they're not the easiest thing to do, but I think they're the most uh, clear thing to prepare for. At, at uh, a rider my age, I have as much trouble preparing for a one day race as a as say a Grand Tour, just because I think to do well in a Grand Tour and to perform in to be able to perform in, in the third week of a Grand Tour requires years and years of um, of of training and and you know doing grand tours but one days i think you can prepare for and just by training you know doing long training rides and and weeks of higher volume training i think it's it's easier to prepare for a, a one day race so yeah that that that's where i um was able to to kind of uh, excel this year a little bit and and show what i'm capable of and um yeah i was really happy to take those opportunities and and uh just kind of show that you know, I am capable at this level and it, it gave me a lot of confidence personally. During the Ardennes, you posted a comic-like uh, Instagram story where you had the temperature me measured and it read Classics Man. You seem one who really loves what, what, what he does and, and seems to put every bit of your heart onto it. So uh, yeah. you have that attraction to meet like those monuments, right? Yeah, for sure. I I think it's funny just because my whole um, my whole junior career, I I didn't I thought of myself as a pure climber because I used to be quite small, believe it or not. I I mean I think I was tall for my age maybe, but I was super super skinny when I was young, and the only thing I could ever do in races was climb. That was the only those were the only times I got results and. Um, and so I just thought it was funny that, you know, my Neo Pro season, the races that I, the only race that I did well in were, were classics where uh, typically climbers don't fare well. So, uh, yeah, I was, I just thought it was funny. And um, no, I, I mean, things are changing quickly with me and, and I've grown a lot in the last few years. So it's hard to say um, kind of where that'll, that'll put me as far as, uh, you know, what type of rider I am. But I think, I think this this season, I, it, it was a it was a nice uh, opportunity to be able to experience those classics. Before Christmas, we asked Johan uh, the same question I'm going to ask you right now: is why did you choose to stay for so long in the team? Because you renewed your contract until the end of 2023, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. And uh, yes. and how do you expect to progress as a rider in the upcoming years? And and Johan said that. Uh, he doesn't want to rush the process. Uh, he wants to um, to say uh, to try to fulfill his expectations as soon as possible. It's not his objective, uh, but yeah. to 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 leave the transition into a uh, more built, well built cyclist. Uh, we were talking before about the time is on your side. Do you feel the same as, as Johan? regarding this i do yeah no i definitely do um i feel as though it's i think it's a huge advantage to have um a contract this long at my age because it basically allows me to not get caught up in the the kind of cycle of contract years where you're forced and you have the pressure to to perform on a certain year in order to secure another contract and I think having the ability to know that I'm that I'm okay and I have security until 2023, until I'm age 24, is uh, it's huge, and it, and it allows me to explore like different avenues. I can I can try this race without pressure of having to perform, or you know, go down maybe go down the Grand Tour route of trying to see if I can become you know pretty well in a Grand Tour, and there's no stress or. Or whatever of having to um, to perform in, in one aspect or another, I can kind of just explore my uh, my my limits and um, and see where I'm good without uh, without all the well, without all the stress. So unlike the contract that was put before you before the Lavenir, this was a no-brainer, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so three years, okay, yeah, I'll sign it. For or, sure. Or, 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 or do you ha do you put uh, any thought about it? You had a lot of I did. Process? Yeah. 
No, I mean, honestly, I did put a lot of thought uh, into it. I, I wasn't, um, I mean, it's it's a lot to, to commit to a team that you're ready for three years. And um, I, I did think a long time about it and had a lot of discussions with my coach and my agents about if it's the right move. And I, I, I came to the conclusion that for sure it is. I don't have any doubt in it at this point. I think it's a, it's a huge advantage and it's huge confidence that the team is showing in me and, and Johan that uh, they believe that we're capable of, of a lot. So I think it's kind of the perfect thing to confirm that, you know, that uh, confidence from the team and say, yeah, look, let's work together and try to make uh, something great out of it. And, and uh, I think when you have two parties like that and they're both uh, they're both kind of agreeing on something, it, it, things can work really well. So you are right now in, in Nice, in France. Uh, we wanted to know uh, when did you actually move there? If it was uh, before you joined Ajay Dosser or under 33 afterwards. And what made you go for that to that place? The climate, the atmosphere, uh, and how's your life there? Because you, I know that you have a, a lot of training buddies also from the pro peloton, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I moved here uh, after I signed for Movistar, so the the season leading up to 2020, so 2019 fall, I moved here fully. I had been here uh, already a few times to visit uh, during my year in Chambéry and before that. So I had kind of already uh, explored this place and um, having learned French that year in Chambéry, I think uh, it was just an easy move for me to, to stay in France because I, I feel comfortable speaking French and uh, just being within the French culture a little bit. And also, uh, you know, my roommate here is from the same hometown, uh, same town as me in Boise, Idaho, and we grew up, you know, living and training together. So it was kind of a just an easy, easy move for me to, to come to Nice. And I moved in with him. And um, yeah, it's it's amazing. Uh, I really like this town and the weather here is is incredible all year. So uh, it's it, it, to me, it's the ideal to live at this moment in time. I, I uh, don't see any reason to leave. There's an airport and has everything I need, honestly. So good. Sounds good. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> Before wrapping up, uh, two questions, one about the past and one about the future. Uh, yeah. Can you tell me what's the best thing you learned this year's, the first, your first pro season? Uh, the best thing I learned, that's an interesting question. I think, um, I think I just need to, you know, stop using my head as much as I do. I think uh, one of the big things I've learned is just to, not overthink uh, the training and the racing and the, the race calendar and uh, all these things and kind of just uh, let it happen. Just, you know, go through the, the motions of training and allow my race calendar to be what it is because uh, I think there's just, you know, not a lot of reason to, to stress and worry about these things when a lot of it's just out of, out of your control and um, it's better to be lower stress. So that's one of the things I've learned. That's a good, a good lesson. And talking about the future, uh, talking about dreams, uh, what do you want to be like in 12 months and in 20, in 12 years? Well, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think 12 months, I want to be capable and uh, maybe reliable at winning uh, professional races. I think uh, within a year, I think it's, it's a reasonable goal to be able to, you know, be relied on by the team to, to win a race uh, and maybe already have won a race by then. Uh, that's that's definitely my goal. And 12 years, uh, that's that's a whole nother thing. I think um, hopefully in 12 years, I'm still a pro cyclist. Uh, that would be the dream. And to have, you know, to be able to, to maintain this career for that long, like, you know, guys like Paul Verde have done, is an impressive feat to me because it shows that you just have a lot of consistency and um, it takes a lot of hard work to maintain, you know, that many years of, of being a professional rider. So I hope to still in 12 years be a solid and capable athlete and pro cyclist. So two ambitious goals. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> to say the least. So <laughs> hopefully we, we will see you accomplish them 
Aplong Dishing Them Up. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mateo, for your time. We'll see uh, we'll see each other very, very, very soon, and we we will be, you will be riding your bike on on the competition in, in very few weeks. So yeah. best of luck. And, Thank you very much, Albert. And thank you for your time. Ciao.